So, welcome everyone to my talk about uh, doing fetching, configuring, building uh, your Yocto project with just one command. Well, I'm also cheating a little bit, we will see about it. Um, but first of all, who am I here? Um, so I'm from Siemens, uh, the Siemens Technology specifically. We are a smaller group or larger, depending on how you look at it, uh, of Linux experts, uh, called ourselves the Linux uh, Competence Center, or shorter these days, Linux Expert Center. We are now as consultants to Siemens uh, units. Um, Enablers of many Linuxes, not all of them by far, but many Linuxes at Siemens products. Um, so possibly you have ridden one of our products by taking a train. Um, we are gateway to upstream communities, um, not exclusively, by far not as well, um, but um, that's also one of our roles. And we are also maintainers of several open source projects on behalf of Siemens and beyond. Um, for myself, I'm doing it for 16 years now at Siemens, um, trying to navigate the ship these days more than doing it, but still I'm also a maintainer of many, too many open source projects. Well, you will see. Um, so yeah, that's for the background. So before starting with the details, so first of some quick survey here. Who of you has heard about CAST before? actually reading my abstract, it's a phrasing. Uh, <laughs> who of you has actually used it before? Aha. Uh -huh. Still quite a lot. Who are using it with a cast container? Not anymore, too painful. <laughs> Thanks for the back. <laughs> Anyone here actually using it for Debian ESA builds? That's not, not too many. Too <laughs> <laughs> Let me throw something about it. <laughs> Okay, so a little bit of a summary of what Alex was also talking about and, and keep in mind this is starting six years from now in the back well, where we started to, to work on this problem. So how did you set up at that time specifically um, a Yocto project? Well, first step, um, fetch some of your repos um, manually according to README, not that uncommon, with the help of a custom script, not preferable, using the repo tool was mentioned before, maybe there's some other tools as well. Next step, creating the configurations, BBLayer conf, local conf, um, well, usual patterns, um, using the right template is also one, obviously, which is preferable, but wasn't done on all cases. Then run the um, build environment, which part of include the former step if you use the template, yes, um, and then choosing the right target to build. So far, so good, you were happy, well, you forgot two steps, first step, pray that you didn't miss anything about it to find out that you did, but because in some cases actually the host environment makes a difference and while well, your local user configuration can also make a difference despite all the effort that Yocto is taking and back then not so much these days even more to prevent that this actually makes a difference, it did in the past. So that brings basically uh, what to the question, now what does CAS now mean? Um, is there any native variants in the room? I saw someone, I heard someone. So CAS means in Bavarian cheese, yes. And what else? Nonsense. And that was the impression that my colleague had at the sense when we're looking at this, this is nonsense. Um, so out of that impression was part of this was influencing the name of uh, this tool. So think of cheese, um, but who invented it? The Swiss word again. Um, <laughs> the first uh, commit actually came from uh, Daniel Wagner at that time at Siemens, um, working on his uh, first Yocto project and trying to solve this problem in a generic way or more generic way it was done back then. Uh, we went pretty early public with that um, in June 2017. Uh, and I remember him discussing this problem with Richard Purdy back then here in uh, Prague um, at the ELC 2017 and trying to pitch a little bit that something should be done there. And I'm happy to see that something is now done. But anyway, the project evolved more or less under the radar of most people, I guess. Um, we got actually a first contribution in 2018. In 2019, we thought this is now done. It's 1.0. Um, um, we also headed over the project management. Daniel went for enterprise. I'm still doing embedded. Um, so I took over that, uh, what he was starting. 
And at some point, and I think the guy is in the back as well, um, someone talked about CAS as a nice tool, maybe useful, and we suddenly got a lot of contributions um, from people. And first want to mention here Paul Barker, who was actually contributing significant parts from Yocto people on that uh, tool, and since then it was really taking off. There are many other contributors, I think, in the room here. Um, so where we are today, um, we have a, a tool which is now version 4.0. The versioning is uh, come out locked with the uh, build environment we are using. Uh, but anyway, this is where we came from, where we are. Now, what is CAS again? So CAS is really about that single command to build up uh, a build to get to the image. And that's not only, but also targeting Yocto users who are used to this, but it's also targeting users who are more interested in the image than in the process. Um, so you have that command, you run it, and you get your image. Um, or even if it's not liked by everyone, you take it in a container. Um, and you don't even have to worry about all the dependencies you need, first of all, to run the native command. Or these days, we'll talk about more, you run into a menu, and you choose, basically, what kind of combination you want to have from this reference layer, maybe. So one command for them all. Uh, well, OK, you have to clone the bootstrap repo, first of all, to be fair, so it's not really one command. But that command easily migrates, as you can imagine, also in a CI environment. And that's one of the goals as well of that. So now, how do you get to this uh, configuration file that we are referencing here? And how does it look like? Um, so it's, it's a uh, JAML file that we use. We also support JSON if you like to have more brackets or curly braces in your text file. But anyway, for the readability, I took here the YAML version of it. Um, that's, so to say, a self-contained example uh, to build a uh, QEMO image from Pokey. Um, so you have your header version. You have here, so to say, pulled out. Um, out of the local conf section, which comes below um, the distro, the machine, um, the target you want to build with this specific file. Then comes the most important part, all the repositories. Here, both regarding where they are coming from, but also what layers they are carrying for your build here. So you can configure them both in one place. And then comes the section, optional in some cases, recommended usually in other cases, um, pieces you want to add to your local conf. Header, because we are also generating some bits of the local conf. Um, which can be derived from the setups. Um, and you could also do the same, but this is not needed in most cases to um, add also pieces to your BB layer conf. Um, this information here is enough to generate a BB layer conf um, out of the thing. So then you are done, and this is actually executable, and you get a QEMO image out of this. How do you interact with Bitbake? Yes, yeah, sorry, we are wrapping. Um, so as I said, um, normally you specify with one file what you want to build, and that's done. If you have variations of it, you can still override it and say, I want to build another target. So you kind of modify on the fly your configuration file. You can also run specific uh, tasks of these targets, um, also possible. Uh, you can also pass forward commands, like uh, give me the environment of the whole thing to Bitbake directly. Um, or if you really don't like all the wrapping, you just say cast shell and you are in that environment where you can natively interact with Bitbake or other tools of the Yocto ecosystem on that shell level. So these are the, the kind of wrapping you have around that. Another feature um, which is, I think, kind of unique here is that uh, we can already combine certain configuration files, include each other. That allows to build more complex configuration without repeating yourself, obviously. So here's a, um, the top level configuration file on the left bottom, uh, left top, and you have some base configuration that you want to reuse possibly across certain files. So you state here, please include that file. That file can be in the same repository um, as the main file. It can also be in other repositories as you were just uh, fetching them. It can become quite complicated, uh, but in most cases it works. Um, what happens then if CAS uh, pulls the top level file? It kind of merges these two together. So you get a, a virtual, not, not directly visible, um, configuration file in the back where you pull in certain so say, the things which are only specified in one of the files and where you can override other things, like in this case, the machine configuration. You can override what has been decided in the base file by the top level file. 
This kind of merging and on, on overriding um, via the include files happens uh, from top to bottom regarding the include ordering in your in your top level files, and then depth first regarding um, who sets the first value, and then you go up and up and up. Uh, who sets the final word, so to say, on these overrides. Again, you can do obviously here complex things. Um, I wouldn't recommend to go become totally complex, uh, but depending on your use case, um, that can be quite useful to avoid repeating yourself in this kind of configurations. Now, another scenario that we quickly evolved, because the initial idea was, okay, one file to rule them all, then you found out, okay, maybe another file to rule them in the debug build, and then came another board, and then comes another configuration, so the number of configuration files grew with the base idea of having just one file. Um, so the next logical step for us was, okay, we have some variation here, some combinatory, so let's make uh, configuration fragments, um, so have multiple files. The includes to a certain thing uh, is contributing that already. So let's say you have a main configuration file uh, for your distro and, and your main repositories, and then you have a selection file for your different machines and maybe some configuration fragments or configuration fragment files for features. Um, you can roll them out, and what you can then do also on demand is combine them on the fly on the command line of CAS by just colon appending them onto that. So again, what happened in the background um, is that CAS is building some kind of include. It's virtually rewriting the main uh, configuration file and adding these includes of the fragments that you were appending on the command line. And that allows you to, to provide to your users uh, yeah, a combinatory that you don't want to um, uh, a roll out and, and write to individual files in, in your bootstrap layer, possibly. Quite powerful, but obviously also with some limitations because the command line doesn't restrict you in what you combine. You can combine also impossible combinations. Maybe one machine is not really supporting a certain feature or is not really prepared to these kind of configuration settings. And that led to the question, also in the combination, the question is also how to um, the explore what kind of pieces are there. You can define conventions where files are located. Okay, there's a folder which is called machine. Probably there are machine fragments and there's a folder which called feature or options. But in the end, your user has to, should be given a certain um, information about what is reasonable uh, combinatory available with these kind of configuration. And that basically led to the idea of having an interactive menu for that. Um, so just like you know, um, well, Buildroot has something similar, the kernel office has something similar, where you can just go there and, and uh, explore, so to say, interactively what kind of combinatory is available, but also express, that's why we chose here in this case the kconfig language, what dependencies exist in these things, and which are kind of choices, which are kind of features, and, and all this stuff. And you can even enter here some values, if you like to, um, in the menu. So, Again, we chose an existing language um, with, with all pros and cons. So the pros definitely is we didn't have to invent an own language, which usually goes wrong in the first attempt. Uh, we could also even leverage an existing, in this case, Python library to implement the language. Um, and it actually proved to resolve quite a few problems in our deployment scenario, specifically if you have end users on the end, other end, which you first of all have to explain what all of options exist there. Nothing's for free. It also comes with some cons. You will see it uh, in the next slide on the example side that um, if you actually uh, express that combinatory in the config file, um, as we didn't change the language, the kconfig language, you have to map it somehow on the cast language, the cast configuration. That mapping is not really natural. It works, but it's, well, a bit cumbersome in some cases. Anyway, and also what always comes, but this is actually also true for the, for the previous slide, don't misuse this. You can now build a weird kind of combination. You can add a lot of numbers and you will man maybe end up in something like uh, build root in the sense you can configure everything. That's not maintainable, obviously. This is really thought to be for some high level choices. I have ABC boards, I have CDE features. Let's make them combinable. Maybe I can choose a certain version or like yeah, Mikkeldor, Master, or you name it of my, dis of my, of my build system. These kind of variations really what it's about. So how does it look like from a technical perspective? The conf kconfig file um, well has also a, a um, header section where you define the menu, um, the title of that. 
Um, then you have uh, yeah, the main file you want to include. Then you can build choices here, for example, to select the machine. Um, I've highlighted here some special syntax. Um, the CAS, CAS include config snippets. Those are basically, which are magically interpreted by CAS as being, OK, this is a, a string uh, config variable. It's referencing a CAS configuration file. So please make out of this something in the end which can be interpreted as CAS as a configuration uh, combination. Um, so you basically uh, represent what you have in the CAS configuration YAML files. You map it in something which is here interactively selectable and also you can express here um, as you see on the right regarding um, dependencies that the feature B actually depends on not being used on the QEM x86 machine. Also, as I said, you can also specify here variables which takes input values if this is needed. May the root password by default, I'm not sure if this is a good idea, but anyway, you could do that. You can pass in here also uh, variable numbers. So that's what, what cast happens now if you, if you run that menu command and after asking or answering all the questions, maybe some one step back, keep that menu here in mind, you can save that or you can save and directly build the whole thing. So again, the user doesn't have to worry about what's the next step. Um, if you save the thing, um, what happened here is a, is a small uh, cast file is generated, the .config, not h or something like that, but .config YAML file, uh, which can actually just be passed to cast for building. Um, so it's technically uh, compatible. Um, it contains a little bit more than this one, and you can also use it just like you're used to it from the kernel possibly to go back and reconfigure your configuration or to store it if you like to, but that's what's happened in the background with that. So how do you now manage your repositories, your workflow regarding updating um, repositories? And that was something, well, we discussed also all the time. We had our own workflows dealing usually with much less layers than you have in a, in a larger Yocta project. But anyway, there's one way obviously to do this manually. Yeah, go for your CAS configuration files, edit there the shards and uh, bump things around. Doable, doesn't scale, we know. Um, we have now a different workflow available as well. Um, so you can basically select uh, branches in your repository configuration and say, I please check out the latest version of Mikuldor, for example, um, make it run. And if I'm happy with the configuration, I can lock it down. So I can generate um, a log file, um, which then again is interpreted on the next build as being actually the ruling file uh, defining the revision that you are actually um, checking out or that you're actually sharing with others when you are um, exporting the whole result. So that's one way to um, maintain basically a floating testing environment while then locking it down for production or for handover. Another thing that is possible in the workflow is um, it's also quite unique that you can patch your layer. And we had a lot of discussion. Actually, I was initially against this feature as well because patching your layer means that you're doing something wrong. So either you are not doing BB append or something like this, wrong from the philosophy, or you're not doing upstream first, also wrong from the philosophy. So if you really have to fix something in infrastructure. But however, it turned out to be that this is helpful even if you are playing according to the rules. It helps to be upstreamed to test to be upstream patches. We are doing this heavily. So the rule usually is you can patch a layer in this cast configuration file, but that should be gone the other week or the other months at least, if there are some discussion. But it allows you basically to feed in your upstream or to be upstream patch in your CI, in your workflows and already deal with it locally while it's being regulated also upstream. So if you want to patch, I don't know, if you want to patch Bitbake or if you really want to patch something in infrastructure, classes or stuff like this, this is normally not doable with BB Append and Co. Um, you can actually test it as if it were or upstream already without creating a fork repository, which obviously you can also do for, uh, for the upstream Pokey repository and things like this. But this is really, from my perspective, helpful to be proven helpful if you don't abuse it. We had one aspect recently, and this was almost the point where I got my first CVE or where I was about to file my first CVE um, as a project maintainer. Um, so there was a problem in CAS, and this is really CAS problem historically. We had just one ref spec which was able to be used uh, both on um, specifying a commit ID and both specifying a branch, a floating thing or a tag. 
um, and that allowed attackers theoretically, if you if you if they are in control now of your mirror repository, for example, to sneak something in in your build flow. Um, it turned out after discussion with the, uh, the reporter that um, there is more behind it. Well, it boils down in the end right now in our ecosystem that uh, our source code management tools use SHA-1. Um, and if this is a collision is possible at some point, you are burned in any cases. Still, we improved on that. Um, so yeah, the first attempt was or to fix this uh, maybe sustainably by uh, adding proper um, checksumming um, to the repositories you are checking out. So basically like BitBake is also allowing you to say, to take a fetch from the Bit repo a Git repository or take a snapshot of a tarball and then char some um, the tarball. Uh, something like this could be added to CAS and I played around with naive approaches, with less naive and then with own approaches in the end. We discuss it in the community. Um, the problem is, uh, it's not really, it's not really a cast problem. It's rather an ecosystem problem of the SCM. So maybe they find a better and smarter and more sustainable solution than cars. Um, and, and in the end, also, is it already realistic to have a shark collision on your Git or HG? So we also support Mercurial repository today. Debatable. Um, the current is a statement. Yeah, you have to trust your upstream repositories in this regard. Make sure that you're not pulling from random repositories anymore. Um, but still, this is what we've discussed. And so the current situation is we still resolve the initial problem of the you not clearly identified ref spec. We have now changed a little bit the syntax that you have a separate commit and a branch a key to specify, OK, this is really just a commit and nothing else, not a tag, not a branch and nothing else. And that is a branch where you want to write explicitly. And that allows now to avoid this kind of original problem we had above without solving the issue of the SHA-1. But that's again, I don't think really a cast topic in the end. So now coming for the containers. Um, that's also a feature which we er uh, added quite early, also in the in light of CI environments, in the light of that basically everyone, our team had a different distro running on their machines. Um, how to make the environment, the built environment, portable and also archivable. So Cask provides along its releases um, since the very, very early days also corresponding containers. Now they hosted on um, GitHub. Um, one is for the open embedded dependencies resolved, build dependencies resolved using a Debian input feed. The other one is for the Debian ESA build, um, same story. Um, and then they have, so to say, the common dominator of both is a number of packages you need in order to do the connectivity for cloning stuff and doing downloads of artifacts, um, also interacting, for, for example, with AWS uh, bit buckets and stuff like this, that you can fetch from there also artifacts. So this is pre-installed, comes ready to use. Um, we internally standardized on that, and we also recommend it because it makes the story easier for users to get started um, without discussing which Ubuntu version they have to install first. Um, that comes again um, with a script um, to replicate, so to say, CAS inside the container to the outer world. So it's a wrapper script, sorry again, <laughs> which uh, calls into the container and runs CAS there with all these build dependencies resolved decoupling you from the host environment without really having a different kind of user interface um, than you would have with CAS on the, on the native um, uh, environment. Um, that also allows you to lock down your build environment along with your bootstrap layer. So we now have established a pattern that you can just take the script and check it in into your bootstrap layer. Um, that script contains the version of the build container that it was using. So you basically documented this way in form of code what uh, version of the build environment your layers or your layer setup was tested and built against. Uh, it works with Docker, obviously, for the past, but nowadays also uh, nicely with Portman. Um, for, for the OA build, and means also unprivileged, obviously, so it's, it's a nice thing. And we also have an ARM64 container if you happen to have an ARM64 host and don't want to cross build. So that also brings the point of the car sandbox concept. Um, so we have a stronger decoupling from the host than Yocto in an open embedded by default has, at least had. Um, so when cars is run, um, it creates a separate home directory throwing everything away basically what you have in your own configuration um, and that even without using containers and you can only pass in so to say parameters variables from the environment that are explicitly permitted 
So um, allow list based basically. Um, that gives a higher level of control over what's actually supposed to come in, independent of what is happening um, with the versions that you're using there. It can be weakened though, specifically for development environment, at least, our in, no, at least without the container scenario, you can weaken these kind of um, rules by saying preserve the environment, my user environment. Uh, however, if you want to export this to a CI environment, you have to think about actually what you have just pulled in implicitly or explicitly. Um, from a beginner perspective, I often heard, what is this thing doing here? I'm confused, so it's possibly one of the most disliked beginner's features. Um, but we are kind of stuck to that um, with good reason. So uh, again, we came from a time where this was really very needed and helpful. Um, some people told me recently, oh yeah, there's still not enough of cases where this would be really useful and is really useful. Um, again, we also want to foster the migration between local and CI environment by giving this kind of um, yeah, guidance around it. And last but not least, um, we really try to keep the cast container usage as smooth as possible also for the compared to the native usage and there you need to know what you have to forward from your host into the container. It doesn't happen magically as it is with the uh, normally with an, um, a native build. Now, I don't want to repeat what Alex nicely explained um, regarding what is the bit bake layer approach by now. Um, uh, again, we've saw it already. There is now the file to, or the files being created to have the, the repository setup replicated, and there's a way now to generate also the, the templates, which gives you quite a bit of pieces. So, pros of this approach clearly is this is how Yocto is lived, and it obviously is also uh, uh, kind of consistent with the Yocto community in the sense of how you should use it. While, well, we are not in the part of the Yocto community with this thing, so we may also get something wrong. There's a risk, although we have Yocto contributors. Yeah, this is definitely the, the official way. No, no doubt about it. Still, it has still some limitations. Some of them might be temporal. Others um, might not be desirable to solve from our perspective. Um, as we learned, there is an idea now, um, not yet totally flashed out, regarding how to make this coarse-grained um, interactive configuration maybe possible one day. Maybe we can help to inspire this as well, or to rule out how to not do it, I don't know. Um, the cross-layer reuse of the configuration file, not sure if this is in scope um, already, or if it's considered to be useful with cars, it is possible. Layer patching, no, no, but the official opinion on that is. It's coming with CAS. Um, the older uh, versions of CAS and uh, the older versions of Yocto and Enisa, they are not addressed. This is basically agnostic to it, but this is just a matter of time, I would say. Even for ESA, it's solvable when we do the next bump of our internal tooling. Um, what's not in scope, not sure what the official opinion is, is the host decoupling, so the container thingy. Um, if you like it, you may want to look at this. If you don't need it and you don't like it, well, then you are fine with what uh, Yocto is doing natively on that. So with that, um, let me quickly summarize. So CAS makes your BitBake builds easier portable from our opinion. Single line, bootstrap scenario, um, stronger decoupling from host. Uh, stable build containers, uh, which uh, resolve the dependencies kind of automatically. And you have this interactive configuration, which is quite useful, I guess, for also for many of the SDK board support vendors, combining certain things and making a broader set of configuration available to their users. And we had some discussion about all this as well, as well already. So what's next for CAS? Um, we had quite a couple of times a discussion, could you just add this or that to your containers to make also the test working, including a complete QEMO environment? Um, so currently I'm pushing back on this still because we want to have build containers, not test containers, but maybe it's time to rethink it and actually fork off or also provide test containers. I'm open to the discussion about that. Um, and as now the, the native tooling is evolving, it's obviously time to observe this and maybe discuss also where we should actually step back as CAS and say, okay, this is no longer our business. There's an alternative to this. Maybe make some bridges or whatever to, to make use of both of them while focusing on the steps that the native environment, the Yocto environment may not be willing to address uh, for the upcoming future. 
Um, and in the end, this is something, it's your call, um, specifically as there are way more Yocto people here in the room than there are Debian folks. Um, so tell us what you are interested in, what you like to see, what you do not like to see, and where you see basically chances of improvements um, in, in both directions, also regarding in the interoperation. Just for the reference, there is the project URL, there is the documentation URL, we are on mailing list. Um, and there are also some example layers here, um, reference an external one, I think Ross is somewhere in the room, for MetaArm. Um, there are two um, layers from the ESA world, but conceptually, as I said, this is very similar to what uh, Yocto is doing. Yeah, with that, I'm ending my talk. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. <clears throat> So not really a question, but a, a, just a information. So I gave a talk uh, about the crops generator, which is a new tool to generate crops containers. So those are build containers for your Yocto, your Yocto environment. So we will help to solve the host OS problem by letting you build a known host environment into a container. Um, and that will support repo, get sub modules, costs, and the new OE core tooling. So it's, it's still a little bit young. We also chose to use kconfig for exactly the same reasons. So cool. just wanted to let you all know about that. Thanks a lot for the overview. Um, one question that came to my mind, um, you pointed out at the beginning that CAS um, yeah, hides away the Yocto stuff from the users, so users that are not interested don't have to deal with it. When you're done building, um, the users are there and say, where's my image? So it's stuck somewhere in the Yocto build tree. Um, and also sometimes you have some custom post-processing you need to do. Did you ever think of adding some post-build steps, some post-build hooks that you can add as a user? Uh, thinking about it already, but it becomes quickly quite complicated. So what is the common dominant you can abstract, you can provide in form of, okay, now you have to run the following command to flash your image or, I don't know, to, to take the artifact and put it somewhere where it's useful. Um, I'm open for a suggestion. Um, right now, we often still have for that step also a readme. Now you can go to the following folder, pick the following artifact and go for your um, USB stick and get it to the device, for example. Um, maybe there is some room for improvements. It wasn't just the major point point yet, even though even the cases where we are facing end users, so to say. Um, but yeah, I'm open for that kind of suggestion. Um, if you have a good idea, come forward and we can discuss a design about that. Okay, thanks. Good. Yep. Uh, one more. <laughs> Hi. Uh, you were briefly talking about the layer setup, but I think you uh, said that is also uh, uh, this is all done uh, by big big layers. Did I understand that correctly? Um, that was basically the reference to how big big layers working. Um, if you choose the other path, the non-cast. This is the non-cast path. Just for reference, it's not, we didn't integrate bitbake layers into CAS at this stage. So generating a CAS config like Alex is doing with the bitbake layers, so the setup layers config, that's currently not what we do with CAS. Could be done, everything is done. So by the way, I didn't mention CAS has a plugin concept as well. You can write plugins to this, I think even local ones if you like to, um, wouldn't recommend it. But anyway, it's technically possible. You can do anything on top of this if it's reasonable, it's a different question. So currently really the layer setup is something which is more or less manually done in most of our cases. You don't have to do it all the time because of the tooling to later on maintain them. Uh, but yeah, that could be a theoretical problem if it's solving enough people's uh, pain. It, it's, it's edible, but right now we didn't have anyone who stepped forward and said, yeah, that would be really make it even more useful. So, yeah. And the layers that are in the CAS uh, YAML config file that are just to generate the BB layers? Exactly, exactly. Ah, okay. So in most okay. cases, you can just get it from there. And, and it's even easier if you have a, a single layer repo, you don't have to specify anything. It's assumed to be the only, the way is around. If you have a bitbake repository, you actually have to say, this is not a layer, by the way, mm. exclude it. 
doable. So this is the default assumption is that this is a layer or it has, it has multiple layers included. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, I've seen that on cast container can be used, for example, for GitLab CI directly for doing my build. Uh, I've seen that it is it is used by Bent Arm, for example, but they have a quite complex configuration because they build a lot of targets. So I'm asking you if you have a more simpler example or if there's some documentation directly inside CAS to use continuous integration with GitLab CI. Um, so how to use it in, in, in CI environments? Yeah. yeah. So there are, there are two patterns actually you can use. Um, and I think you find both of them here in the oops in the referenced uh, ESA layer. Sorry, um, so the the ESA CIP core we have a .gitlab CI YAML file. There we reference the container we want to run the scripts in, and they then so to say use CAS natively inside the CI script. That's the one case. Um, the Meta ID twenty fifty our product layer is running on uh, GitHub GitHub Actions. There you get a VM and you can run uh, the CAS container script natively. Um, so you have to, so to say, you, you have the CAS container command line in your CI script. So both is possible. It's transparent, so to say. It heavily depends on rather what your environment is, is able uh, to handle. Um, also depending on the Yocto, it's easy. You have the free choice. It's usually unprivileged built. With ESA, we have the more complex things because we are taking Debian bootstrapping things. You need a certain privilege environment, and there you need a runner which is compatible with this environment if you want to uh, use the native approach. Um, but it's doable, obviously, if you're in a VM, then you can do every, everything. So both is possible, and it's really like, okay, this is the command the user is also running. Take it, put it in the, in the CI environment, you have the same thing. This is where we started, actually. Okay, thanks. That was another question. Is it possible to uh, insert credentials for artifactory or API tokens in, into? Yeah, the so obviously you shouldn't files? you shouldn't check them in, yeah. <laughs> um, but you uh, the normal pattern is to pass them in via the environment, or you specify also if you take for example SSH keys, you can specify a folder which contains the um, the deployment keys for your build and pass them in. Um, so for CI, usually we be, uh, your preferred approach is to have them environment variables, CI environment variables, protected ones, and those sneak in then into the build. And you can do the same in the local environment uh, to have it on pair. Um, that's normally the pattern we use here. And, and you have to configure them uh, or whitelist the environment variables. Uh, so uh, they don't uh, there clean. come off, uh, go for the, um, the documentation here about the environment. There are a couple of them are predefined, so they're pre whitelisted, um, so to say. Um, that's for the common cases, uh, for SSH keys, for example, or SSH uh, demons even. Um, and others you would have to pass and explicitly by, by saying this is an environment variable I'm taking here and I'm handling in CI as well as locally. Uh, but quite a few cases are already covered. And if you find something which is generic but didn't, isn't covered yet, please come forward. We can discuss this. We just had it with some more details, but most cases actually are covered by now. And entering them into the config file or local conf would not work? It would work, but it would create the danger that you check in the credential. That's the whole point. Okay, yeah. um, so if you have it in your CAS configuration hard-coded, <laughs> uh, you will no, get attention. No, like to, to get it from the environment and then ma make CAS inserted into the local conf file that's generated. Uh, code, technically possible. If this is no, needed, depends really on, I don't think you need this for, for Bitpack to run properly and to have the fetching working downstream there okay. that you've entered there. Okay. Can you also handle site.conf? Somehow? I mean, uh, we I can't actually. This little has little. been discussed a couple of times. So honestly, I don't have a good design pattern for that yet. Again, this is a call. If you have solid uh, cases for that, uh, we can discuss how to model it properly. Uh, right now, it's not generated. It's not consumed. It is not handled this way. Uh, we handled the site-specific configuration, basically environment variables in most deployments. So yeah, that's the situation. Yeah. Thank you. That's time. Thank you, Jan. Thanks a lot. Thank you.